There's a decent chance you'll be watching healthcare triage videos about diet soda studies until the day you die. The odds are exceedingly good it won't be the soda that kills you, though. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. The latest batch of news reports on diet soda came a month or two ago based on another study linking it to an increased risk of early death. As usual, the study, and some of the stories, lacked some important context and caused more worry than was warranted. There are specific reasons that this cycle is unlikely to end, and we're going to talk about them. First, if it's artificial, it must be bad. People suspect, and not always incorrectly, that putting things created in a lab into their bodies cannot be good. People worry about genetically modified organisms and monosodium glutamate, and yes, artificial sweeteners because they sound scary. But everything's a chemical including dihydrogen monoxide or water. These are just words we use to describe ingredients. Some ingredients occur naturally, and some are coaxed into existence. That doesn't inherently make one better than another. In fact, I've argued that research supports consuming artificial sweeteners over added sugars. The latest study concluded the opposite. Second, soda's an easy target. In a health-conscious era, soda has become almost stigmatized in some circles, and sales have fallen as a result. It's true that no one needs soda. There are a million varieties, and almost none taste like anything in nature. But there are many things we eat and drink that we don't need. We don't need ice cream or pie, but for a lot of people, life would be less enjoyable without those things. None of this should be taken as a license to drink cases of soda a week. A lack of evidence of danger at normal amounts doesn't mean that consuming any one thing in huge amounts is a good idea. Moderation still matters. Third, scientists need to publish to keep their jobs. I'm a professor on the research tenure track, and I'm here to tell you that the coin of the realm is grants and papers. You need funding to survive, and you need to publish to get funding. As a junior faculty member, or even as a doctoral student or postdoctoral fellow, you need to publish research. Often, the easiest step is to take a large data set and publish an analysis from it showing a correlation between some factor and some outcome. This kind of research is rampant. That's how you hear year after year that everyone's dehydrated and that we need to drink more water. It's how you hear that coffee is affecting health in this way or that. It's how we wind up with a lot of nutritional studies that find associations in one way or another. As long as the culture of science demands output as the measure of success, these studies will appear. And given that the news media also needs to publish to survive, if you didn't know, people love to watch videos about food and health, we'll continue to read stories about how diet soda will kill us. Fourth prestigious institutions and the press. To do the kinds of analyses described in this episode, you need large data sets that researchers can pore over. Building the data set is the hardest part of the work. Analyzing the numbers on hundreds of thousands of people isn't child's play, but gathering the data is much more expensive and time consuming. Because of this, a few universities produce a disproportionate amount of the research on these topics. They also tend to be the universities with the most resources and the most recognizable names. Because they're also usually prestigious, they attract more researchers and more funding to build bigger and newer data sets. They also get more media attention because of having access to more researchers, prestige, and funding. If the research is coming out of a super respected institution, it must be important. Lather, rinse, repeat. Fifth, we still don't understand the limitations of observational studies. No matter how many times we've stressed the difference between correlation and causation, people still look at increased risk and determine that the risk is causing the bad outcome. For reporting on hundreds of thousands of people, observational studies are generally the only realistic option. With very few exceptions, they can tell us only if two things are related not whether one's to blame for the other, as opposed, of course, to randomized controlled trials. With respect to diet soda, it's plausible that the people who tend to drink them also tend to be worried about their weight or health. It could be a recent heart attack or other health setback that's causing the consumption rather than the other way around. But you shouldn't assume that diet sodas cause better health either. It could be that more health-conscious people avoid added sugars. Many of these new observational studies add little to our understanding. At some point, a study with 200,000 participants isn't better than one with 100,000 participants because almost all have limitations, often the same ones that we can't fix. Dr. John Awanidas wrote in a seminal editorial, and I'm quoting him, individuals consume thousands of chemicals in millions of possible daily combinations. For instance, there are more than 250,000 different foods and even more potentially edible items with 300,000 edible plants alone. 
And yet, he added, much of the literature simply assumes disease risk is governed by the most abundant substances. For example, carbohydrates or fats. We don't know what else is at play, and using observational studies, we never, ever will. Observational research is still the best way to study population-wide risk factors. Sophisticated techniques like regression discontinuity can even create quasi-randomized groups to try to get closer to understanding causality, but too few employ such techniques. Moreover, too many reports still focus only on the relative risk and not on the absolute risk. If a risk increases by 10%, for example, that sounds bad. But if the baseline risk is 0.1%, that 10% increase winds up moving the baseline to only 0.11%. It'd probably be a public service if we stop repeating a lot of this research and stop reporting on it breathlessly. If that's impossible, the best people can do is stop paying attention so much. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this other episode on why nutrition research is often so terrible. We'd also appreciate it if you'd like and subscribe down below. Another thing you might want to do is to go to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where like our research associate Joe Sevitz and our Surgeon Admiral Sam, you can help support the show, make it bigger and better.